The college basketball AP poll came out on Monday and the Zags were unable to secure the number one overall ranking for the third year in a row, settling instead for number two behind the North Carolina Tar Heels. But after returning three starters and adding big time transfers, does Gonzaga deserve that preseason number one spot? You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates throughout another season of college basketball and Gonzaga hoops. All right, we're talking AP poll today. It just came out on Monday. It is officially marks the start of the college basketball season, or at least one of the steps to get to actual college basketball games being played. The Zags came out at number two on the AP poll behind the North Carolina Tar Heels. It was kind of always going to be a toss-up between those two schools. It felt like most places had them one or the other. Houston was in the mix as well. They ended up being third in the AP poll. Kentucky was fourth. And then Baylor and defending champion Kansas Jayhawks tied for fifth. That is your top five. For the AP poll, it's the first time in two years the Zags haven't been number one. For a while, it didn't look like the Zags even really had necessarily a chance of being the number one team when there was some uncertainty about what their roster was going to look like between the end of the college basketball season or I guess the end of Gonzaga's season, uh, the Sweet 16 loss to Arkansas. Before we, of course, had the magical day or two, 24, 48-hour period, excuse me, where Rasir Bolton, Julian Strother, and Drew Timmy all opted to return back to Spokane. Malachi Smith, Efton Reed joined the party uh, around the same time. Reed a little bit beforehand, Malachi Smith right afterwards. All of a sudden, the Zags were back in the mix. There was a lot of con- con- conversation at that time of like, are they going to be the number one team for the third year in a row? I think part of the reason they were not selected is simply because of a bit of fatigue. <laughs> Having them be the, the preseason number one team for the third year in a row when they haven't won a championship might have rankled some people in a way that perhaps caused them to go a different direction. Having said that, North Carolina is in a pretty darn good spot. We're talking about a team that is returning four key starters. The Zags are returning three, which is fantastic. North Carolina is returning four. Armando Baycott, Leaky Black, Caleb Love, RJ Davis, all extraordinarily talented players, all coming back into the mix for the Tar Heels. The only starter they're losing is Brady Manek, the Oklahoma transfer, who was a stretch four for them last year, shot about 40% from deep. Really, really key player on that team. Fortunately for Coach Hubert Davis and the Tar Heels, they replaced... Brady Manek with Pete Nance, transfer out of Northwestern, who averaged 14 and a half points per game last year. He was a 31% three-point shooter prior to last season, but last year he exploded as an outside shooter, shot 45% from deep. So you have four starting, four returning starters for a team that finished second overall last year, lost in the national championship game, of course, to Bill Self's Kansas Jayhawks. They returned four out of five starters. They replaced their other starter with a player who is Pretty much the exact same player, potentially a better version of said player. North Carolina also keeps a huge amount of their depth. This is a very, very veteran-laden, experienced, deep basketball team. It's very, very understandable, in my opinion, why they are ranked number one. However, I think it's important to remember that North Carolina did not go into the NCAA tournament last year expected to be in the national championship game. If we were talking about a a number two seed or a number one seed Tar Heels team, which is very often the case for North Carolina, they've been a a premier program for decades and decades and decades. But we're talking about a team that was a number eight seed last year. This was not a good North Carolina team last year during the regular season. They caught fire at the right time. They had a really, really nice stretch throughout the NCAA tournament. I'm not taking away from the, the performance they put on during the tournament or even the caliber of player that is on this team. Like these guys were good and they were probably a better roster than an eight seed during the regular season. 
but they lost some bad games. The ACC was down as a whole, which did not help them. So there are some similarities, and I've seen this brought up a handful of times. There are some similarities to what happened to UCLA a couple of years ago when UCLA, now they were not an eight seed. They were a play in 11 seed. There's a pretty substantial difference between being squarely in the field as an eight seed versus barely even making the NCAA tournament as a play in 11 seed. But that UCLA team, went on a torrid run through the NCAA tournament. Dang near made it to the national championship game. They can thank Orlando Magic point guard Jalen Suggs for the reason they did not make it to the NCAA tournament championship game. But they kind of had this huge amount of hype going into the next season because they were returning all of their starters. They had a high-level impact freshman coming in in Peyton Watson, and they'd never really reached that threshold. I think that as the season went on, it became kind of clear that, hey, maybe there was – a bit more helium around that team than perhaps there should have been. Some of the flaws that we saw from that team during the regular season, uh, the year that they went on their deep run, showed up again the following year, as you would expect. Of course, UCLA also did not get nearly the level of production from Peyton Watson that they expected to get. They had some injuries to their front court, which cost them some some significant time. Certainly the Gonzaga game in the during Feast Week and Thanksgiving, that game was probably would have been more competitive had UCLA had been healthy. Although I think it's hard to watch that game, even knowing that there was some health concerns with UCLA. I don't know that you can watch that game and think, yeah, this team is on par. Like Gonzaga blew the doors right off of them in that game. And I do think that that UCLA team perhaps had a little bit more helium, but does that mean that we should be discounting North Carolina, a team that again, returned four starters brought in Pete Nance, who is not as big of a question mark as somebody like Peyton, Peyton Watson was, for UCLA that year. So I think that I think that North Carolina deserves it. I think that Gonzaga also deserves it. I think that you could go either way. I really don't think that either pick is wrong necessarily. I'm also not entirely sure that Houston is a bad pick either. I think Houston's probably probably right on at number 3. Kelvin Sampson has obviously done an incredible job with this team. Marcus Sasser is back. He's going to be a really, really good player. The best guard in the NCAA would be a lock for all, all first team for the entire, for the NCAA all American first team. If there weren't so many good bigs returning, if we didn't have Armando Baycott, Andrew Timmy and Oscar Shubway and Trace Jackson Davis and Hunter Dickinson all returning to school, there's still a great chance that Sasser ends up in that conversation. Three really, really good basketball teams. Gonzaga losing Chet Holmgren hurts, losing Andrew Nembhard hurts. I think people are going to look at those two losses as being more impactful losses than the losses that Houston had on their roster than losing Brady Manek has for North Carolina. I'm guessing that that is playing a factor. I think, again, some of the fatigue around Gonzaga plays a factor as well. I also think it's uh, pretty important to note that AP pool doesn't matter all that much. I understand that it is a, a, a big talking point in college basketball. It kind of, again, signals the start of the season for a lot of people, uh, and it kind of bring it it causes some conversation some people chatting about it at the water cooler uh, talking about it on social media whatever it may be but looking back the AP poll has been one of the least predictive polls in that that exist out there regarding like who's going to win the national championship the AP poll has rarely been particularly impactful in that regard so it's not something that I'm personally taking all that seriously certainly shouldn't be something that I think Gonzaga fans should be taking all that seriously. I would also note that while not being number one three years in a row is a bit of a bummer, the Zags are also now in their 51st consecutive AP poll where they are in the top five. That is incredible. 51 consecutive AP polls that have come out have had the Zags in the top five. 51. There's only been two streaks longer than that in the history of the AP poll. Next up is Kansas at 61. So if the Zags can hold on to it for 11 more weeks in the top five, which means they got to go, they have to have a very successful run through the non-conference slate. If they can get to 62, then that would defeat Kansas, who had the same streak from 1995 to 1998. I have a feeling that it's going to be a really, really difficult to ever catch number one on this list, which is the UCLA Bruins, who were in the top five for a whopping 149 consecutive AP polls. 149. The streak started in 1967. It ended in 1976. The, um, the country of America had gone through a cultural shift 
a huge cultural shift from the late 60s to the mid 70s. And in that time, UCLA remained a stagnant piece in the top five of the AP poll. Ran through Kareem Abdul-Jabbar at the time, Lou Alcindor's incredible career. Of course, Bill Walton's incredible career was in that streak as well. John Wooden, an all-time legend, a fantastic record. The Zags, long ways away from there, but being number three on this list behind UCLA and Kansas, tremendous, tremendous accomplishment. All right, we're going to come back in the second segment. We're still talking AP poll, but instead of looking at where Gonzaga landed, we're going to look at Gonzaga's ridiculous non-conference schedule and discussing if it's the toughest schedule they have ever had. But before we do that, I want to tell you all about Upside. From cringing at the pump to getting an eye-popping check at your favorite restaurant, inflation is hitting us where it hurts, and it really hurts. That's why I started using Upside. Upside is an incredible app for anyone who buys gas, groceries, or dines out. With every purchase, I'm earning cash back thanks to Upside. The app is crazy easy to use, and there's no catch. To get started, download the free Upside app. Use my promo code LOCKED to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Next, you claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside. Check in at the business, pay as usual with a credit or debit card, and you get paid. In comparison to credit card rewards or loyalty programs, you can earn three times more cash back with Upside. Upside users are earning more than a million dollars every week, and that is why they have a 4.8 star rating on the App Store. Download the free Upside app and use promo code LOCKED to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10. That's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more using code LOCKED. All right, segment two, still Andy Patton, still Locked On Zags. Still want to thank all of you who have made Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. Also want to thank all of you who are checking out the show on YouTube, trying to get to 1,000 subscribers. We're less than 40 subscribers away. So if you are listening to this and you haven't done so yet, go to YouTube.com, search Locked On Zags, hit that big red subscribe button. It is much, much appreciated. All right, we're talking Gonzaga's non-conference schedule here in the second segment. And folks, It's been talked about a handful of times for those of you who are regular listeners of the podcast. You've heard about it on here. Even for those of you who are probably only semi-regular listeners of the podcast, you've probably heard about it as well because I've discussed it quite a bit. Gonzaga's non-conference schedule is is absolutely staggering. It is an obscenely good non-conference schedule. And while I mentioned I don't take the AP poll super seriously, it stands out that the Zags are guaranteed at minimum to play four top 25 ranked teams in the non-conference schedule. And that's not counting Tennessee. The Zags are playing Tennessee on October 28th. That is happening. Tennessee is ranked in the top 25. The reason I'm not counting that game is because it's not a real game. It is an exhibition game. Still, in terms of evaluating what Gonzaga is trying to do, Mark Few's goal is to get this team to play as many tough games as possible. So while, while the Tennessee game doesn't officially count, it counts in the sense that it's it's accomplishing what Mark Fee wants to accomplish. He wants to put this team through the ringer early. And he's done this in the past before, and I think it's an attempt to kind of maybe switch the differences between how not difficult the conference schedule is. We know that the WCC is not on par with the Big Ten or the SEC or the Big East or any of those kind of conferences. We also know that the WCC is not nearly as bad as many people like to make it out to be. But for the Zags, the best thing they can do to ensure that their team is as battle-tested as possible is to put the toughest teams that are willing to play them on the schedule. That is what Mark Few has done. He used every opportunity that he could. He used his exhibition game to schedule a team like Tennessee. He used, obviously got them in the PK-85, which is going to potentially give them more high-ranking games. Right now, we're counting four ranked opponents We're not counting Tennessee. We're also not counting Duke, but there's a very, very reasonable chance that on the Sunday after Thanksgiving, the Gonzaga Bulldogs will face the Duke Blue Devils in the PK-85 championship. The Zags have got to get through a couple games first. They're going to play either Purdue or West Virginia in the second round. Neither of those teams are ranked. Purdue was receiving votes, so they're a good, high-quality team as well. Uh, But this this is a Gonzaga team that could end up facing six top 25 teams 
before the new year, before 2023, they might have already faced six top ranked teams, uh, including number four ranked Kentucky. That's the first one. Number five ranked Baylor, number 12 ranked Texas, number 20 ranked Alabama. Those are the four big ones. And these are going to be really, really good games. I'll go through them quickly one by one. Kentucky, of course, November 20th at the Spokane Arena. Very, very exciting game. Part of a six-year series between the Zags and the Wildcats. Mark Few, John Calipari got this thing done. It's a high-level game that's going to happen every single year through 2027. The Wildcats have, have had a couple disappointing years. They went 9-16 and 16 in 2020 during the bubble season. They obviously lost last year to St. Peter's as a number two seed to a 15-seeded team. Uh, that was a really tough loss for Kentucky, a really happy win for everybody else in the country, effectively. They also lost four of their six top players from last year. Ty Ty Washington is gone. Kellen Grady, that's a big one. Those two guys are both gone. But you can lose four out of your six best players, but it's helpful when one of the guys you do return is the National Player of the Year in Oscar Shubway, he's going to be back. Jacob Toppin, younger brother of Obi Toppin, he's back. The reports that we're reading on him are phenomenal. He's going to be very, very good this year. They also brought in Antonio Reeves, an Illinois State transfer who averaged over 20 points per game. And oh yeah, because it's John Calipari, because it's what the Wildcats do, they have two of the best freshmen in the entire country joining their team this year, and Chris Livingston, Case, and Wallace. This is going to be a really, really tough team at the Spokane Arena. It's going to be a, a they're going to be really, really tough out all season long. And then, of course, you have the Baylor Bears. They're number five, tied with the Kansas Jayhawks for the fifth best team in the country. Zags are playing them on December 2nd in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, it's, of course, a rematch of the 2021 National Championship game. Uh, the Bears also lost a ton of talent from last year's team. Matthew Mayer went in the transfer portal. James Akinjo, Jeremy Sochan, Kendall Brown, all of those guys are gone. A big part of what they're trying to do to replace that uh, production is Keontae George, a superstar stud freshman, going to be a top 10 pick in the 2023 NBA draft, borderline top five pick potentially if things go according to plan for George. He's going to be an absolute monster for that team. They also added West Virginia transfer Jalen Bridges and a very, very familiar face for Gonzaga fans, a BYU transfer Caleb Lohner. I don't know how much of a role he's going to have with the Bears, uh, but it makes it all the much more sweeter because this is already an intense rivalry because of the national championship, but you add a player like Caleb Lohner who said some not so nice things about the Zags in the past, even more fun, even more fun. Next up, the number 12 ranked Texas Longhorns, November 16th at Texas, a true home and home. The Zags blew the doors off of Chris Beard's team in his first season at the kennel last year. They attempted their no middle defense, which is kind of what they were have been known for what Chris Beard was known for at Texas tech. It was a complete disaster. Drew Timmy scored 37 points. He made it look really, really easy. Uh, not sure what they're going to try to do again. I think that's a, a fascinating aspect of this season is, are they going to continue to try the defense that, you know, has made Chris Beard famous, has made him one of the most well-known coaches in the game, even though it didn't work last time. Are they going to try to do something else? Is he going to back away from the this, this system that he's kind of really hung his hat on for so long? Or are they going to try to do it again? And if so, is it going to have similar results? For the Longhorns, they got a lot of players returning. They also added Tyrese Hunter, a really high-profile transfer, very, very good athlete, and they added a superstar freshman in Dylan Mitchell. Those two guys are going to be a big part of what the Longhorns do this season. And last but not least, the Alabama Crimson Tide. Zags are playing them on December 17th in Birmingham. They played last year at the Battle in Seattle. It did not go well for the Zags. Gonzaga is hoping to return the favor by defeating Alabama near their home stadium in Birmingham. The Crimson Tide lost Jaden Shackleford. They lost Keon Ellis. They lost J.D. Davison. Those were three of the biggest pieces from their team last year, three guys who really hurt the Zags. Uh, they did add Mark Sears from Ohio, who I think, quite frankly, outside of maybe Pete Nance, outside of maybe Kendrick Davis at Memphis, uh, Mark Sears might be the best transfer in the country. He's going to have a phenomenal season in NATO. It's a system. Averaged 20 points per game at Ohio last year. Uh, again, losing Shackleford and Davidson, this team has a need for a ball-dominant guard. They got it in Mark Sears. He's going to be really, really good. The Crimson Tide also added a couple nice freshmen in Jaden Bradley and Noah Clowney, and I think they're going to be a tough, tough out, not just for the Zags, but for just about everybody they play this year in the SEC. All right, we're going to come back. In the third and final segment, we're going to chat with Jason Jordan of Sports Illustrated. He has the scoop on Gonzaga's latest target in the class of 2025, as well as a prospect who is taking an official visit to Spokane in just a few weeks. Before we get there, though, I want to tell you all about Nissan. 
Our partners at Nissan have worked with us to create a new segment across the Locked On College Network titled Thrilling Moments, where we highlight the most exciting play from the Zags' latest game or throughout the team's history. Gonzaga's season is still a few weeks away, so instead, we're going to look at a thrilling moment in program history. While there are plenty to choose from, looking at the schedule reminded me of Gonzaga's epic feast week battle against Duke in Maui in 2018. Brandon Clark, Rui Hachimura combined for 37 points. The number three Bulldogs defeated the number one ranked Duke Blue Devils 89 to 87. It was one of the most heart attack inducing games I have ever watched. One of the most intense games in program history upset the number one team in the country. Really, really exciting game. Perhaps we will see a Gonzaga-Duke rematch in the PK-85 this season. This segment has been inspired by the thrilling new designs featured across Nissan's new lineup of vehicles. Pursue what thrills you in the all-new Frontier, Armada, or Pathfinder today. Available now at NissanUSA.com. All right, welcome back. Segment number three, still Andy Patton, still Locked on Zags, and we're chatting here with Jason Jordan of Sports Illustrated, getting a look at some of Gonzaga's recruits. The first person I want to talk about, Jason, is the visitor at the Craziness in the Kennel event last Saturday, October 8th. That was 2025 prospect Nick Kamenia. He was sitting with Dusty Stromer. Got to think that he also played AAU ball with Colby Brooks, who is on uh, the Gonzaga as a walk-on. You got to think it's a pretty good sign that he was there. Uh, can you talk to me a little yeah. bit about who this kid is and kind of what, what kind of player he, he's going to become? Hey, always a good sign when they're in the house, you know, <laughs> you can come yeah. in the house and can sell them, uh, sell them like no other time. So mm-hmm. definitely a great sign there. And then sit with Dusty. That's obviously um, that's, you know, that's invaluable. Mm-hmm. Um, young kid, six, eight thrives as a playmaker, but he's a shot maker, you know, mm-hmm. six, eight um, stretches the defense, but he, you know, I, He's a he's a a, a gifted playmaker. Like so, he mm-hmm. has great great ability to create his own shot. Mm-hmm. Obviously, like I said, he's knocking down shots from the perimeter very efficiently. But um, he can get to his spots really well. And he here's the thing about him: he takes the right shots mm-hmm. uh, based off what the defense gives him and based off what he sees. And he's a high IQ guy who mm-hmm. can get get to points on the court um, because of his length and his uh, height. Mm-hmm. And he's able to shoot over smaller guards, but he gets by people uh, pretty efficiently as well. And he gets to the cup too, so he scores on all three levels pretty efficiently. Mm-hmm. But you know, the thing that that is most dangerous is his ability to stretch the defense because you have to respect that. Yeah. So when you push up on him, his length um, enables him to go by you, and then his IQ comes into play, and so mm-hmm. that's what makes him the most dangerous. But that you know, that first line is you get up on. He's a shooter. Get him. Get him. Get yeah. him. You know. When you're talking about prospects this far away, you know, we're talking about a kid who who just started his sophomore year of high school. He's right. very young, obviously. Some, What are some of the characteristics that I think stand out even more because some of the physical projection maybe is not quite there yet because of the age? So is it like the basketball IQ, IQ element? Is that like a bigger part of it when you're looking at a kid that young? Or what are some 100%. things that maybe stand out? Yeah, 100 percent. That's why I say he takes the right shot. So that yeah. that that part is something you would look at certainly for a 25 kid. And I don't mm-hmm. really look at kids that much younger unless they're like, yeah, I'm sure I'm told to, or, you know, cause at some point <laughs> yeah. it gets a little cringy, you know? Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly it IQ would be number one, but then just feel, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and I guess that kind of goes in IQ, but in a way it mm-hmm. doesn't. Um, cause some things are just innate. Um, sure. and so he, he definitely has a great feel. He had a really big summer with BTI and mm-hmm. um, he he definitely has the feel. And and when you talk about strength, most guys think about strength, like a, the future project. He's not going to on the most. Let me break it down in nine uh, scouting. Mm-hmm. Let me just be in layman's terms. Well, he shouldn't be as weak as he is now in two years. That's what they're saying. You know, the, right. not the progression. They think he'll be stronger. Right. Mm-hmm. Most people say that the reality is, um, it's not substantial. Usually yeah. those leaps aren't substantial strength wise. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'm more so lean to, like you said, high IQ. And then I feel mm-hmm. is something I look at um, yeah. when I see that they're, you know, they're, you know, they're dominating. Okay, cool. Well, let me see. He's younger. Okay. Let me see how he handles. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I'll, how he handles criticism from a coach. Can the coach get on him? You know, body language stuff. I'm right. huge on body language. Cause I think that tells a lot about you as a player. So mm-hmm. um, he checks off a lot of boxes. That's why a lot of people are, 
really excited about him. So it'll be it'll be very interesting to see. Um, a lot of people will be watching him this sophomore season for sure. Yeah. Uh, when talking about, we kind of touched on it a little bit, but getting getting guys in the house, obviously that's so critical just to, to have them here on campus. They made the trip. You can sell them on different ways, but I'm curious the impact specifically for these kind of like fan fest events. You know, Gonzaga's is called craziness in the kennel. I know basically every program, certainly all the high profile programs have fan events like this. Are they often used like really in a, in a specific recruiting way. And do you think that it has like a, a big advantage to be able to kit, get a kid in for something like that and not, not necessarily a game, but a big event in that regard? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's like a, a marketing dream for a school, mm-hmm. you know, because uh, especially at these preseason events that fans, I mean, you guys don't have a problem with your fans, but mm-hmm. you know, the fans <laughs> most places are, are super excited because you haven't, you haven't made mm-hmm. them mad yet. You know, so right. like, what could be? We're gonna cut the net, and every fan base is like yep. George Mason. No respect for me, George yeah. Mason fans are like, we're gonna do it this year. It's national title, or but you know, mm-hmm. like, or we're gonna win the league. You know, everybody's excited at the beginning, yep. so you can really capitalize off that emotion, that energy. You can mm-hmm. get the fans to chant the kid's name. You know, that kind, all that stuff plays in, and yes, it does matter. Yep. Kids are um, in a good way at this age anyway they, yeah. they got a little bit of an ego that's good you know that's okay that's okay yeah. especially on the court um but yeah this is the part where you really have to sell your brand and what it's like the look at what it's like to come Ooh, look at this like Caden cooper said mm-hmm. uh, when he visited you guys man i mean there are <laughs> celebrities there you know yeah. like, man like that people look at them in awe you know mm-hmm. and so that's what you want that's what you're going for Yep, absolutely. Yeah. One more player I want to talk to you about, Jason, before we let you go. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be Dedon Thomas. Yeah. Uh, he's taking an official visit to Spokane November 5th, 6th, right before they open up the season against North Florida. Uh, he's got a top six list. It's kind of a list you generally expect, Florida, Arizona, UCLA. Houston is on there, UNLV, which yeah. is where he's from. He went to the same high school as Julian Strother, which you got to imagine is something that helps the Zags out, especially since Strother has had such a successful career and is hopefully going to have a really, really dominant junior year. Uh, talk to me a little bit about Thomas. I know we've talked on him a little bit on this podcast already, but for new listeners, yeah. uh, kind of what kind of player he is and maybe if you're getting a sense of, of what schools are really standing out for him. Yeah, so, I mean, he just – I don't know if people watch, but he just dominated the Border League uh, this past mm-hmm. weekend. Um, but just tough, gritty, hard-nosed yeah. point guard, about 6'1", six, 6'2", six, um, depending on the shoes. Mm-hmm. But uh, definitely a big-time shot maker. And uh, what I like to say about um, him is that he's clutch. Like, he, yeah. he thrives in the moment, you know. And so mm-hmm. if if it's a um, – I saw a clip recently, and they kind of – but in the same mold, not the same player. Don't mm-hmm. don't get me. But mm-hmm. um, remember, I saw. I think it was the Bulls thing where they were like Michael Jordan. You're, you know, uh, mm-hmm. the game is on the line. I think it was Amari Rashad. And then you're like, well, who takes the last shot? He was like, he looked mm-hmm. at him like <laughs> me. Right? What? <laughs> yeah. Like, what are you talking about? Right? <laughs> he kind of has that. Like, give me the. You know, I, I'm yeah. taking the last shot. He's that. Yeah. He's a. He's got the clutch gene. So, yeah. um, you know, and that permeates in every other aspect of his game as a leader, as a guy mm-hmm. who understands uh, tempo and pace. And mm-hmm. you want that in your league guard, obviously, but he's a, um, you know, a type A on the court, but he's super efficient at all three levels, but just a, a big shot maker at a big moment, you know, mm-hmm. he's that guy. And, yeah. and that guy's a, you know, a guy you want on your side, obviously. Absolutely. Yeah. Looking at his, his list here, obviously a lot of programs with really successful yeah. point guard play in recent years. Uh, you know, Arizona, Tommy Lloyd, they got that high octane offense. Gonzaga yeah. South, uh, as it is. UCLA obviously has had just tremendous amount of success. Kelvin Sampson in Houston doing excellent work. Uh, I know he's a 2024, long ways away. Do you got a sense of, of what program he's kind of leaning towards, or is it really just – uh, depends on yeah. how these visits go for him. Yeah, it's, it, I think it depends on that. And I think, you know, we'll know more in the spring. Like, because mm-hmm. I know he's he's certainly going to go through the process. Like, he's yeah. uh, lining up visits for March, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, <laughs> I don't think anything – We I don't think we'll know anything until, like, AAU-ish time, you know, yeah. or post, post-Geico Nationals, you know, sure. that kind of time. Mike Down is All-American. I think that's when some lists for him will mm-hmm. start to get trimmed a little bit. But I think he's, um you know, even more. But I think, you know – and I haven't heard that he's a reclass guy. So, yeah, uh, yeah I think we're going to know more in the spring. But right now, I don't think anything's 
moving as far as, you know, somebody being head and shoulders above the rest. I have not heard that. Gotcha. Yeah. Jason, thank you so much for taking the time coming on the show. Uh, obviously love having your expertise with some of the recruiting stuff, hoping to continue to to chat with you more as the season gets going. We're, we're just a couple weeks out. It's very, yeah, very close. That is crazy, but yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me. I look forward to talking to you again.